Okay, welcome to uh, 2015 CAPESA Toronto meetings. Uh, my name is Edna Mueller Markham. I'm the past president. Uh, Claire Sampson's in Ottawa, so I'll be hosting the meeting today. Um, so today, um, our, our talk is being given by um, Dr. Christian Haas from the Canada Research Chair in Arctic Sea Ice Geophysics at York University. Uh, his research focuses on in situ airborne and satellite observations of the sea ice mass balance in the Arctic and Antarctic with applications to climate research and offshore operations. Before moving to York University in 2012, he was an, Al an Alberta Ingenuity Scholar with the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada since 2007. He graduated in geophysics with the universities of Kiel and Bremen, Germany, and worked for more than 15 years with the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research in Germany, where he was the head of sea ice physics section. So please let us welcome Dr. Christian Haas with the Arctic Sea, Where Are We Headed? Thank you. Thank you, Edna, and uh, thank you for uh, all here coming and, and for everybody to uh, tune in online. Um, I'm very excited to be here uh, because I, I don't get to speak to geophysicists very often. But uh, as you have heard, I am a geophysicist by training, and I started with uh, seismic uh, reflection seismics. Uh, and I did study at the same institute, for example, uh, where, where Bernd, uh, for instance, uh, has studied and, and, and has been the director for a couple of years. So uh, it's great to be back in the geophysics uh, sphere. Um, and uh, when uh, I, I, I talked to my wife uh, about this meeting, I said, you know, so uh, we'll, we'll have drinks uh, before the meeting, and she couldn't believe, and she said, well, what kind of a meeting is, is this? I said, well, you know, this is geophysics. Like, these are, we are the down-to-earth people, um, and, 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 and so uh, that, that's all about uh, us. Uh, and so uh, today, uh, I, I, I won't talk so much about Earth and, and solid Earth, uh, but I want to talk, uh, I want to take you out onto the ocean, actually. Uh, but on ocean you can walk on, so uh, it's the frozen ocean uh, and it's sea ice cover. And uh, I like to uh, call my talks uh, Arctic Sea Ice, where are we headed? Because uh, I would like to introduce the, the issue about Arctic Sea Ice in general. And, uh, you know, I mean, like, who hasn't heard that Arctic sea ice is shrinking? Okay, you all have, right? So, but, uh, but still we want to know where is it headed? Like, uh, what, where are we going with the sea ice? Will we lose it completely or are uh, the chances uh, to, to, to uh, maintain? So where are we headed uh, as, uh, as humans and uh, as the world? Uh, but then I would like to talk to about where are we headed as sea ice geophysicists? What is our research uh, going to bring? And uh, what role does geophysics, and in this particular case, uh, electromagnetic induction sounding, uh, what role does it play in addressing uh, these issues about uh, the future uh, Arctic Ocean and future Arctic sea ice? And so, uh, unfortunately, uh, and I, I thought for, for general interest, it's probably more interesting to talk about sea ice than uh, to talk about frequency domain electromagnetics. Uh, but I, I have extended my talk uh, for those who have heard this last year in, in the physics colloquium, for example, here at the university. I have included a little more uh, geophysics. And then in the end, actually, I've got some, some slides which we could talk about uh, after the, the, the presentation has ended and uh, in order to address some questions which uh, there may be. Um, so uh, I thought I would like to start... Uh, just with a little review of uh, what sea ice is, actually, uh, because there's a lot of confusion about the melting ice and the melting Arctic. And uh, I will talk about uh, sea ice, and, and I'm a sea ice researcher. Uh, and I would like to remind you that sea ice, of course, is uh, the, the ocean that freezes because of very cold air. And as such, sea ice is very different from glaciers, which form on land uh, from the accumulation and compaction of snow. And uh, whereas glaciers, as you know, uh, can be very thick and uh, most prominently, of course, occur uh, on the ice sheets in Antarctica and the ice sheet of Greenland, uh, play an important role for if they melt, the uh, sea level would rise. Sea ice is only very thin, actually, and floats on the ocean. And because it's thin and because uh, it, it's, so, it's got so little volume, uh, if it melts, it uh, will not 
uh, uh, lead to uh, rising sea levels or anything. However, sea ice, because it's got a wide surface essentially, uh, it has a high albedo as we say and reflects most of the solar energy back into space, uh, plays a very important role in the radiation budget uh, of the Earth among other uh, uh, roles in the climate system and uh, therefore modulates our climate on uh, short and long uh, timescales. Uh, and, and so these maps of course show that, uh, yeah, as, I, as, I, as I indicated, I, I was asked to sh use the mouse here. I hope you can see this in online for sure that people can see this. So uh, gla glaciers and ice sheets cover Greenland and Antarctica uh, and uh, the sea ice cover covers the oceans uh, surrounding Antarctica, the southern ocean here, and uh, the Arctic Ocean which is uh, the, the ocean, the four kilometer th uh, deep ocean between the continents of Siberia and North America, of course. Um, uh, these maps show uh, uh, another important feature of the sea ice, which is that it is highly seasonal and that uh, it expands strongly in the winter, which is shown here for February, which is winter in, this, in the northern hemisphere, and shrinks uh, strongly during the summer which, uh, and, and reaches its minimum in September. And the opposite, of course, uh, occurs in Antarctica where the seasons are reversed. So the maximum ice coverage uh, occurs in uh, September. And so this uh, strong seasonal variability is an important property of the sea ice and makes interpretations of sea ice uh, change actually quite difficult. Uh, the other uh, difference or important differences I wanted to point out with these maps between the Arctic Ocean and the Southern Ocean is uh, that, uh, of course, the, the, the situation is completely different and reversed. The, the South Pole is on land under this uh, several kilometer thick ice sheet and uh, the continent of Antarctica is surrounded by oceans, whereas the North Pole is in 4,000 meters water depth uh, in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, which itself is surrounded by continents. And this plays an important role for the climate of these regions, actually. And as we will see, the, uh, we, we talked about the shrinking Arctic ice cover already. Uh, it plays an important role for the differences in the behavior of the ice, because in Antarctica, actually, as I will show you, the ice is not shrinking. It's, it's rather expanding or at least uh, remaining stable, which is uh, important to keep in mind. If we look closer, uh, the photo on the left uh, shows the typical winter situation. As I said, sea ice forms from the freezing of uh, the, the, the ocean uh, due to cold air. And so in the winter, typically at the North Pole, we have temperatures between minus 20 uh, to minus 40 degrees Celsius. And so that cools the water. And when the water reaches the melting temperature of minus 1.8 uh, degrees, which is lower than uh, fresh water because of the salt, uh, it freezes. And the ocean freezes over more or less completely uh, except uh, that this forming ice sheet is very thin and susceptible to the winds and currents which move the ice around and uh, occasionally lead to openings of the ice which you may see in the background here uh, where, where then uh, open water is exposed to form a new ice. However, as I said, the ice is very thin and of course that's indicated by the presence of this icebreaker here uh, which uh, has sailed, her, uh, sailed there herself and not has been, hasn't been washed there by a tsunami or anything. Uh, and, you know, it could do this because the ice is very thin, only about one meter in this case. And you see, here you see the broken channel of the ship, uh, which has uh, uh, refrozen in the meantime because uh, this was uh, during an ice station where we had an ice camp on this ice floe and worked on this ice floe for a period uh, of two weeks approximately. And this ship is the, the German icebreaker Polarstern, which is one of the most uh, capable research icebreakers in the world, more capable than anything we have in Canada, unfortunately, uh, which has facilitated much of the work uh, I will show you. Uh, in the summer, the situation is completely different. Temperatures at the air temperatures at the North Pole even uh, reach uh, zero degrees Celsius, so reach the melting point and typically range between minus five degrees Celsius and zero degrees uh, Celsius. And as a consequence, together with strong uh, solar radiation, uh, the ice cover actually strongly melts. And uh, because it's melting from the surface, because of radiation and air temperature, turbulent fluxes, uh, the snow cover melts first and then the upper, upper layers of the ice melt. And the resulting meltwater actually uh, forms ponds on depressions in the ice surface and these melt ponds subsequently grow and because they have a dark surface, they have a low albedo, they absorb more radiation and actually accelerate their own melting and strongly contribute to the thinning and melting uh, of the ice every, every summer, which you can see in this photo. 
the other aspect, of course, being because the ice continues to move, and uh, due to the movement, uh, you know, which is not homogeneous in, in general, uh, breaks up to form these uh, ice flows of uh, two to three kilometers in diameter, diameter, as you can see here. And so, uh, where these flows drift apart, uh, open leads, so 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 areas of cracks of open water will appear, which have dark surfaces as well, a low albedo, uh, therefore uh, absorb uh, absorb a lot of shortwave radiation. Uh, and, uh, and and absorb a lot of heat and contribute to the melting of the ice as well. And so the ice survives, you know, in certain areas the ice survives the summer melt, whereas in other areas uh, the ice disappears and, 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 and completely melts during the summer. And so the mass balance of the ice really is uh, a result of the subtle balance of winter freezing and summer melting, which is uh, very intense, as I said, uh, even at the North Pole. Uh, so how has, has the ice changed? Uh, this really is uh, the figure that shows uh, what we know about how the ice has uh, changed and shows what, what, what underlies the general public discussion about the shrinking Arctic ice cover. This shows uh, the, the extent of, of Arctic sea, so the area which can be observed by satellite routinely since the 1970s. And it shows uh, from year to year in September the uh, ice extent uh, between 1979 to 2014, so just last September, and you can see that overall uh, the ice cover is strongly retreating by about 50 percent in the uh, overall time period. But you can also see that there's large interannual variability in the ice decrease. And uh, so this is the figure everybody talks about really, and keep in mind, so this describes the, the change of the ice cover in the Arctic during September, which is during its annual minimum coverage. Uh, however, it is important to note that the, this trend is hi uh, highly variable, which uh, uh, points towards the, the various processes and the different weighting of processes and the dependence on factors like weather in particular uh, to govern these trends. And uh, this variability uh, extends you know, not only to the total coverage, but also to the regions which become ice-free every year, which is shown in the top uh, right graph here, which shows uh, the median ice covers uh, in the period 1979 to 2000, which is shown by the uh, black line here. And then it compares this with the minimum ice coverage in September 2007, which was uh, one of these prominent minima here, which we have experienced. And then compares it with the minimum ice coverage in 2012, uh, which is the white area, white area, which is this minimum, uh, the record minimum uh, since uh, we, we are able to observe uh, the sea ice cover by satellites. And so what these maps show is that the regions in which the ice retreats are very different from year to year as well, So, uh, which points to the fact that uh, this cannot be easily assigned just to changing air temperatures or to changing radiation. But what this actually uh, uh, implies is that uh, uh, there are other factors uh, uh, controlling uh, the areas where the ice survives. And uh, as I will show you, these are primarily the winds which A, shift the ice around, and the ice strongly responds to the winds and, and drifts uh, with the winds, and uh, the winds which carry heat from uh, the warm continents uh, surrounding the Arctic Ocean into the high Arctic, and wherever you have a southerly flow, warm wind, warm, like here over the Beaufort Sea, for example, warm winds will bring warm air to melt more ice, and at the same time the winds will push the ice further north, which both contributes to shrinking ice in, in a certain region. And so this strong variability indicates that, that, the, that the factors controlling the ice mass balance are really complicated. Um, I already talked about this strong seasonal cycle, uh, which uh, impedes easy interpretation of these ice changes, actually. And this is uh, better illustrated in this graph, which again shows the same time series uh, since the onset of routine satellite observations of the ice cover in summer, which is the red curve. And this is the same curve I have just uh, shown you, and in winter, which is the blue curve uh, shown on top of here. And uh, what you can see is actually that the, that the seasonal cycle, so the minimum summer coverage and the maximum winter coverage uh, are huge and are much larger actually than the changes in ice we see overall, uh, which implies that every winter the ice cover sort of gets reset in a way. So even after a, a weak summer, uh, the winter can, uh, rec can, can lead to a, a partial recovery of the ice. The ice will be younger, though, and maybe thinner and more susceptible to further shrinkage in the summer. 
but uh, the eye sort of uh, recovers and, 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 and goes back to the and, and, and goes back to large extents. And so what this figure also shows is uh, if you compare the summer trend, which is very strong, as, as I showed you, it's about uh, a decrease of 11 percent uh, per decade. Uh, in the winter, the trend is much, much less, and uh, the winter coverage uh, is still uh, quite large and uh, is shrinking much uh, more slowly. And it may be advisable, actually, uh, to rather consider the changes during the winter to put this into context because uh, this may be more representative of the overall energy budget of the Arctic, whereas, as I've shown you, uh, the summer coverage is strongly reliant on these feedbacks between the melting and the melt pond formation and the shrinkage, the, the acceleration through the ice albedo feedback, as we say. Uh, another remarkable feature about the shrinking Arctic ice coverage is that uh, Climate models, computer models that try to explain the behavior of the ice and the long-term development and try to predict it fail to uh, represent and reproduce the rapidity of the observed sea ice changes. And uh, I'm saying this because, you know, often, you know, climate change, that's something for environmentalists and, and they're exaggerating. But in this case, uh, it's actually the opposite. So. Uh, 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 climate models, you know, which are the tool of, uh, of, of climate researchers and environmentalists uh, are shown uh, by this blue curve here and uh, th there are many climate models operated by climate data centers including Environment Canada and they disagree to some extent right, uh, within the bounds of uh, natural uncertainty and implementation of different processes and uh, the international or intergovernmental panel of climate change, the IPCC, uh, on a five-year uh, turn, reviews these models and uh, provides summaries. And uh, the blue curve here shows the mean predictions of these models from uh, the year 2000. Well, you know, these simulations start in 1950 and extend to uh, 2050 in this case. And they show the, the variability, the range of uncertainty in these models. And you can see that these models predict a decline of the ice, uh, which is relatively small, and it's much, much less than what is actually observed, which is uh, shown by this uh, red curve here. And again, this shows the complexity of the sea ice system, the interplay between melting and freezing, and uh, albedo feedbacks related to melt ponding, for example, and the, the issues related to changes of ice drift and the redistribution of thick ice from one uh, region to another. I already mentioned Antarctica, and, uh, you know, this is a real... Uh, paradox, if you want so, or, or something that's ignored in the discussion, uh, which is that Antarctic sea ice behaves very different from Arctic sea ice, and uh, this uh, graph just compares the same satellite record of summer uh, minimum Arctic ice extent, which you have seen before in red, and compares it with uh, uh, the mean summer uh, Antarctic ice extent. And you can see that uh, during the same period where Arctic sea ice has shrunk a lot, uh, Antarctic sea ice hasn't changed very much, and you know if you perform a linear regression, there is a positive trend, but it's statistically not significant. However, this is the summer situation, which uh, is uh, you know the, the minimum coverage, and the winter cover actually in Antarctica is uh, significantly positive. So uh, winter ice cover in Antarctica is uh, increasing, and so this happens in the same you know on the same Earth, on the same globe with the same mean global climate. A change, but it's just a reminder that uh, we, we, it's, it's difficult to consider the Earth as a whole and that we have to consider regional climate changes and regional differences and the regional differences in the setup of the climate system, essentially. And with Antarctica being surrounded by oceans and being isolated from the, le from the rest of the globe and, and warming that may occur uh, further to the north and in, in mid-latitudes. And so... Uh, what, what is commonly believed is actually that these differences in Antarctic sea ice are related to changes in the stratosphere and changes in winds <coughs> once again, and that these changes in the stratosphere are related to changes uh, of ozone, ozone uh, concentrations and the ozone hole essentially, and that the ozone hole, which is man-made, uh, contributes to the uh, conservation of Antarctic sea ice, uh, you know, which raises other questions about what happens if we fix the ozone hole, uh, will we lose Antarctic sea ice. Um, okay, so so these are the observations, these are the facts, uh, and there's no doubt, there's no belief. Arctic sea ice is shrinking strongly, Antarctic sea ice is constant or slightly uh, increasing, and so the question is why do we care, right? 
and uh, uh, this relates to the fact, I mean, sea ice doesn't raise sea level, so really, yeah, why do we care? But of course, uh, uh, sea ice is important for uh, the climate system as a whole and for climate conditions, and so the key word here is that sea ice contributes to Arctic amplification, which I will uh, uh, briefly explain to you. Uh, but uh, in Canada, of course, we do care because sea ice is in our way in exploring and exploiting uh, natural resources in the north and protecting our sovereignty and protecting ourselves against terrorists who may come in through the Northwest Passage, right? And uh, the Northwest Passage is ours. Uh, we don't want other ships uh, tinker around in it uh, illegally. Um, so, so these are the effects, and, and uh, for Canada in particular, this is happening uh, in front of our doorstep, really. Uh, these changes in the Arctic are highly relevant. And so, uh, once because they affect our climate and, and therefore other, uh, many other factors and, and, and human beings uh, living in the Arctic and uh, down here where we live, and uh, because of these economic and, and other uh, social uh, issues. And so, one of the uh, key issues here uh, is uh, Arctic amplification, which relates to the ice albedo feedback, which I have alluded to already which describes the fact that sea ice has a, a snow covered and has a white, white surface and reflects uh, most of the solar radiation, shortwave radiation, uh, back into the space. However, if we have less sea ice, there's more dark ocean surface exposed to the surface, which can absorb more solar energy, which can contribute to more melting, uh, more warming, which will uh, contribute to more melting, which will contribute to a further decrease and an accelerated decrease of sea ice, and which will lead to an accelerated disappearance of the sea ice uh, and a warming of the ocean. And uh, this is called the ice albedo feedback uh, and, and, and plays a, a very important role within a season, as I uh, said. However, uh, what we observe is that the memory of the Arctic system is relatively short and uh, in the winter, with new ice forming, uh, some of this warming actually seems to get removed, which leads to the case, the fact that the ice uh, uh, pretty much recovers in the winter. However, on, on long-term averages, this albedo feedback has led to what is called amplification, which uh, describes the fact that the Arctic regions, the high latitudes, have warmed much more strongly than the average uh, 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 globe. And this is shown uh, on, on this map here, which uh, uh, shows the change of air temperatures between 1960 and 2009 and uh, red colors indicate uh, warming of uh, more than uh, uh, 2 to 4 degrees Celsius, uh, whereas yellow colors, in, uh, uh, colors indicate some warming, and then uh, the white and blue colors uh, indicate some cooling. And you can see that overall uh, Earth has warmed uh, between uh, 0 and uh, 2 degrees. However, the, the Arctic has actually warmed the strongest and uh, up to 4 degrees. And you can, of course, see that there are some regions, and you know, not coincidentally in Antarctica, where we also see the ice uh, not changing uh, very much, uh, that have actually experienced uh, some cooling. And overall, this graph shows the zonal average, so the mean per latitude uh, from the South Pole to the North Pole. And you can see the, that there is a moderate change in most latitudes, and then in the Arctic. Uh, this is warming the strongest. And so this is due to the ice albedo feedback, due to the shrinking ice cover, and due to the uh, disappearance or, or shrinkage of snow and land in particular as well. And so because this is modulated or maybe even dominated by sea ice, uh, it implies actually that the role of sea ice reaches much further than just the warming, because warming temperatures, of course, uh, lead to the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, which then uh, does contribute to a rise of sea level. It leads to the warming of permafrost with the release of gases, which uh, may contribute to accelerated uh, greenhouse warming. Uh, and uh, the, you know the, the changes of sea ice in some way may be related to changes in weather in mid latitudes uh, and to hurricanes and, and, and other uh, extreme weather phenomena uh, we do experience. Um, so. Uh, what else do we know about the uh, changes of the ice and how can we interpret these uh, changes that uh, are just documented for the surface area of the ice? And uh, for this we have to consider the drift of the ice, the age of the ice, and the thickness of the ice. And uh, only with the knowledge of the thickness of the ice, of course, we can know how the volume of the ice, or so the overall mass, has changed. And uh, 
In order to interpret these changes, it is important again to understand that the mass balance of the ice isn't just due to air temperatures, but due to the complexities and interactions of the ice ocean atmosphere system uh, and the polar uh, seas as a whole. And uh, so, as I said, uh, this graph shows that uh, there are winds, and where there are winds, there are regions of uh, converging winds and diverging winds uh, that push the ice around and currents likewise, and uh, where, the, where the winds diverge, the ice will diverge to uh, open up and expose this open water, which we call leads, uh, where we can uh, then form uh, new thin ice. Uh, and in contrast, where the ice converges, uh, ice flows will be pushed against each other, and if the forces exceed the uh, breaking strength of the ice, uh, the ice will crack and the resulting ice blocks will pile up uh, above and below the, 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 the surrounding level ice here, uh, resulting in these pressure ridges. And so, uh, in the end of the day, we'll, we'll experience an ice cover that is highly deformed, very, very rough, and uh, which is difficult to describe and observe mathematically, right, because it is so variable. And uh, the, the thickness distribution in general is not normally distributed. It's characterized by a strong mode, which describes the thickness of this uh, most frequently occurring uh, level ice, and then a long tail towards very thick uh, deformed ice uh, contained in these pressure ridges. And so, while these processes act on a small scale, they also act on a very large scale, and uh, that is shown in this graph here, which uh, shows a map of uh, a computer model uh, simulating the thickness and the drift of the ice, and uh, the drift is shown by these vectors, and in fact the ice in the Arctic Ocean is uh, dominated by two major drift systems. The one is the transpolar uh, drift system here, which you see uh, in German, this is uh, uh, drift means uh, Strom. Uh, and so, uh, because, because uh, the Arctic is subject to uh, low pressure systems that are created here in, at the south tip of Greenland and are related to the Iceland low, these low pressure systems uh, rotate anti-clockwise and uh, move into the Siberian Arctic. And because they move anti-clockwise, they push the ice uh, in this manner here to uh, form the transpolar drift stream. And the transpolar drift stream, therefore, removes the ice from uh, the coast of Siberia and moves it across the North Pole uh, into Fram Strait and the North Atlantic and the Greenland Sea, where it melts eventually. And the other big atmospheric circulation system is related to the Beaufort High, there's on average a high sea level pressure over the Beaufort Sea here, in which the air uh, uh, rotates uh, clockwise, and this pushes the ice in a clockwise way to result in the Beaufort Gyre. And these two drift systems, you can see, as I said, move the ice from Siberia against the coast of Greenland and uh, Canada, and so as a result of this, the colors show the mean ice thickness. As a result of this, the thickest ice actually uh, resides along the coast of Canada because this is where the ice is pushed to and where it's getting strongly deformed at the coast. This is also where it is uh, at its oldest, whereas in Siberia, where air temperatures are as cold and, and maybe colder than they are in Canada, uh, the ice never grows very thick because as soon as the ice has formed, it is exported uh, into the transpolar drift and removed from this area. And uh, this figure makes it immediately clear that the thickness distribution and the amount of ice in the Arctic overall not so much depends on air temperatures, actually, but more depends on the intensity and direction of these drift uh, fields, which are a function of winds and, and sea level pressure patterns, right? Um, so, what we also, it is important to uh, monitor the drift, and nowadays drift can be monitored by satellites as well, although not as well as it can be monitored by drifting buoys, and these are just GPS uh, sensors nowadays that uh, transmit uh, their position via satellite uh, to us, and, 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 and we, we perform observations of buoy drift as part of the International Arctic uh, Buoy Program. And so over the, uh, and you can see some of these buoys, that they, they can be dropped by a parachute, or we have to land by helicopter or go there by icebreaker uh, to deploy these buoys. And so uh, since almost, uh, or since 30 years, we, we have performed these observations of ice drift, and so we are able to, uh, you know, which, which, which uh, resembles this average drift pattern I just showed you, but which also showed changes in the ice drift. And uh, this is summarized in this figure, which shows the change in uh, ice drift uh, speed uh, over the 30-year uh, period here. And so overall, our observations show that the uh, speed of the ice has increased as well. 
uh, which, which is an important indication of the processes that contribute to the changes uh, of the ice mass balance. And uh, I, I just want to mention on the side that it is interesting that the winds actually have not increased uh, accordingly, uh, as, and, and the winds are the main driver. And so what this is indicative of actually is uh, that, the, that, that, that this relates to the fact that the ice also must have become thinner, because a thinner ice is weaker and can respond more easily to the winds. So with the same wind, you can push a thinner ice cover more uh, quickly than uh, you can push a uh, uh, thick ice cover, which is one of the exciting uh, questions here. With the changes in drift, the age of the ice has changed because much of the ice has been exported uh, into the Greenland Sea where it has melted and has, lost, has been lost from the Arctic Ocean. And again, this can be observed by satellites, by uh, micro microwave emissivity, for example, or radar backscatter. And uh, this animation shows a time series of 20 years starting in 1987 where you can see uh, old ice, uh, more than five years old, shown by the white colors and uh, young ice, uh, as young as one year by the blue colors. And uh, this shows the, the annual cycle. You see the expanding ice in the winter and the shrinking ice uh, in the summer. And you can see the transpolar drift uh, in which the ice uh, drifts across the North Pole and into Fram Strait. And you can see the strong East Greenland current moving ice out into the North Atlantic where it melts. And you can see the Beaufort Gyre as well. And so if we watch this animation till its end, you can actually see, I, you may not remember, but, but even now you can see that over the years uh, we have lost a lot of old ice, which also is the thickest ice. So yes, the ice has become uh, much thinner as well. And so only, you know, you know remember, this, all this region was full of old ice, and now we only have this uh, narrow rim of ice along the coast of Canada essentially being old ice, which is also um, the thickest ice. And so just how thin the ice is and how the, its thickness has changed is still uh, widely uh, unknown. And of course, the areas in which it has changed uh, the most and, and where the ice is still thick and how thick it is. And so that's the, and, and, and the reason for this is that ice thickness is still one of the most difficult uh, observable uh, properties of the ice. And one reason being that the ice is so thin. So no, no geophysical method is easily able to resolve a layer of one to three meters in thickness sufficiently or conveniently uh, over a large area. And the best uh, data we actually have uh, comes from uh, military nuclear submarine missions of the Americans and English who have uh, played cat and mouse under the Arctic Ocean and under the North Pole uh, with the Russians in the Cold War uh, since the 1950s uh, chasing each other. And uh, they carried upward-looking echo sounders, upward-looking sonars, uh, to actually avoid the ice on the one hand uh, and to be able to detect thin ice areas where they could surface. And, you know, why they surfaced, I don't know, but maybe to send the postcards to the families. Uh, but uh, who wouldn't have liked to stand at the North Pole anyways? And so uh, these sonar data have been uh, preserved. In the old days, they were charts, right? So they have been digitized and so on. And they have been analyzed uh, for ice thickness. And that's where one of the best uh, thickness records we have, which actually shows that uh, since the 50s, the ice, has, uh, the ice thickness has decreased uh, uh, very much as well, more than 50% uh, as well. And I'll show an, an, a summary uh, later on. However, uh, who owns a military uh, nuclear submarine, right? So uh, this is not a, a, a convenient or a, a desirable, satisfactory situation for uh, researchers. And so uh, as geophysicists, we have asked ourselves, of course, uh, what can we do from geophysics? Uh, we can't use ground penetrating radar because the ice is still saline and it's highly absorptive. And because it's so thin, we need to use very high frequencies which uh, uh, get absorbed even more and, and have issues uh, with scattering and so. And so the, the prime method really of choice uh, is electromagnetic uh, frequency domain electromagnetic induction sounding, which is sensitive to the conductivity distribution of the underground. And over sea ice, we have an ideal two-layer case of highly resistive sea ice because it's a solid, a solid with very little uh, uh, salt included over a highly conductive uh, half space, which is the, the ocean. And just to give you some numbers, uh, the conductivity of the ice ranges between uh, 0 to 50 millisiemens per meters, whereas typical Arctic uh, seawater has a conductivity of 2,500 millisiemens per meter. So there's a contrast of almost 50 
uh, times uh, conductivity of millisiemens uh, between the ice and the ocean. And so uh, with the frequency domain EM we can uh, very easily, and, and you all know how this works, we, we uh, generate a low frequency 4 kilohertz in this case uh, primary field uh, which uh, propagates and penetrates through the ice unaffected because it's so resistive there's no induction taking place and uh, penetrates into the seawater and in the seawater it induces eddy currents which in turn uh, induce a secondary EM field which uh, propagates back through uh, the, the, the sea ice and back to the instrument uh, in which we have a receiver coil that measures the amplitude and phase of the secondary field. And both the amplitude and phase or the strength of the secondary field are directly related to the distance between the EM sensor and the surface of the conductor which is our seawater which coincides with the bottom of the ice. So from our EM response we can measure the distance between the EM bird in this case uh, and the bottom of the ice and then we have a laser altimeter or a scanning 2D uh, LIDAR in our bird to measure the height of the bird uh, above the surface of the ice and just subtracting these two distances it results then in the ice thickness which is the, the combined thickness of the snow and the ice so the total thickness snow plus ice thickness and uh, we can't distinguish between the snow and the ice because both are very resistive and beyond uh, uh, the, resolu the resolution capacities which is where ground penetrating radar still plays a strong role because with radar that would be the only method that would allow us to measure the snow actually as, uh, synchronously and coincidentally uh, with the ice which is what we are pursuing uh, on, on the site and so uh, the, the nice thing about uh, EM is of course that uh, you can do this from the air and so subsequently we've built uh, these EM birds uh, together with the company in Mississauga actually Ferrodynamics uh, and uh, used them with helicopters this shows us flying to the north of Ellesmere Island here uh, and because the, the, the range of helicopters of course is limited and uh, nowadays at least for universities it's very hard to get hold of helicopters. Uh, uh, we have adapted the method to uh, fixed wing aircraft. This is a, a DC-3 a Basler 67 uh, aircraft in which we've integrated a winch and, and you know everything that's needed to uh, uh, keep the bird under the belly for takeoff and landing and then lower it uh, and, and then uh, fly it. And with this aircraft of course we are now able to survey large uh, distances over, over all of the Arctic pretty much uh, uh, um, and uh, in, in, in various weather conditions of course as well and if the weather is bad in one place we can just fly uh, over the cloud and uh, so uh, you know but still because this is EM uh, the fields decay strongly with uh, with the height uh, we need to fly uh, relatively low also because these birds are quite small uh, you may be familiar with the exploration geophysics birds like the Ditchim birds which are 10 meters plus in length and, and big monsters uh, because we wanted to be able to you know use this efficiently in the Arctic and from icebreakers for example as well from helicopter decks uh, we designed a small bird which is only four meters long and has a coil spacing of only uh, just over two and a half meters and so just to give you an impression this is where, uh, what we do now Oh, there's no audio. Okay, um, you know, so so we've uh, done various experiments where we have performed drill hole measurements on the ground for validation, and then flown this bird uh, over uh, over our heads, which is an exciting experience uh, because at 50 meters feels quite close, and of course it isn't. But uh, so it hasn't become uh, it has become more dangerous in the Arctic. I think not only because the ice is thinner and you can fall in the water, but because there's these birds flying over our heads now. Um, uh, just to uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> um, just to, uh, to 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 demonstrate this a little further. This is actually an example of flying this bird over open water. You know, which is the easiest of all cases. It's just a one-layer homogeneous half space, and uh, it shows. Uh, the EM response, this is the in phase of the 4 kilohertz uh, signal versus height of the bird above the water. And you can see this very nice uh, relationship 
and you you know you can evaluate the 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 the, the accuracy uh, of the measurement, which is uh, for, you know which is dependent on the noise of the, these measurements. And from this behavior, this is an old example actually. Uh, we we have improved the noise of our system quite much, and from you know from from these kinds of considerations and comparisons with drill hole data, uh, we we know that we can measure the thickness of level ice. Uh, uh, as accurate as 10 centimeters. Uh, over deformed ice, these pressure ridges, it's of course more difficult uh, because that represents a, a 3D uh, geometry which is more difficult uh, to interpret. So this is what the measurements look uh, over open water very consistently in agreement with the 1D forward modeling and this is what uh, typical measurements looks over an ice cover. And so, you know, as I showed you in the beginning, over a typical ice cover in the summer at least, you have ice flows. This is a, a view out of a helicopter, and here you see the, the ship again. But there is open water, right? So you have a mixture of ice flows and open water. And uh, the measurements you get uh, are shown here. Uh, again, the EM uh, response versus uh, height as measured uh, by the laser. And so you can see there are two groups of measurements. This one here, which uh, closely aligns along this exponentially decaying line, which actually represents measurements over open water, and then we have this cluster of, uh, of, of measurements which uh, represent measurements over ice flows and from which uh, the ice thickness can be derived. And ice thickness uh, estimation is actually very easy in this case. We don't need to employ any uh, geophysical inversion, uh, but we can simply uh, say that uh, we, with the EM we measure the distance to the open water, which again is well described by this model curve here, and then uh, the ice thickness actually just results from the horizontal distance of any uh, measurement from uh, the, the model curve over open water because uh, this represents the height, the distance from the open water and ice thickness is simply the difference between the distance uh, to the open water to the distance measured by the laser here uh, uh, at the ice surface and so every ice thickness measurement uh, is, is just related to the horizontal distance here. So. Uh, and it has turned out that this is a very reliable, very robust uh, method, uh, as I said, just based on this empirical exponential fit or double exponential, you know, you can, you can of course improve it. Um, and, and as I said, it doesn't really require any inversion, also because it turns out that uh, variations like within the natural variability of water conductivity or ice conductivity don't affect uh, the model curve very much. The, the spread is uh, relatively small for the natural range of ocean conductivity or ice conductivity. And so accordingly, this is a typical example of an ice thickness profile as we fly along. Uh, zero uh, here is the water level and above the water level is the surface of the ice. The ice is like an iceberg, right? It floats. So one-tenth approximately is above the water level. Uh, nine tenth is below the water level, and you can see the the, the resolution we, we can achieve, and you can see the variability of the ice, the level ice here with ridges, thin ice uh, in here, and then the deepest keels uh, down to six meters uh, in this example. And then, uh, because we we can obtain so much information, we can show this. Uh, we, the way to look at ice thickness is to look at ice thickness distributions, which are just these histograms of ice thickness on the x-axis and frequency of occurrence or probability on the y-axis and so you can see that the most abundant ice thickness here is two meters. This is from the North Pole in 2001 and here you see the thick ice contained in the ridges and you can see the significant amount of thin ice and zero ice thickness ice which is in the refrozen leads in open water. And so uh, subsequently we've done this over the years and this is just an example of one of our most successful campaigns which still, you know, because this Air One data is still isn't a complete coverage of the Arctic, right? But uh, the best we can get. So we did this survey uh, from, so the North Pole is here, Canada is here, right? Alaska there, Greenland here. We did the survey from Svalbard uh, to Ellesmere Island, uh, where we worked out of the Canadian Forces Station Alert. And then we moved on to Sax Harbor on Banks Island and then to Barrow in Alaska. And these show the mean ice thicknesses along our flight tracks, the blue colors indicating thicknesses of about two meters and uh, the red colors indicating thicknesses of uh, six meters and you know in, in, in agreement to these general to the general knowledge uh, of what I have shown you in agreement with observations of thick and thin and, and old ice by satellite which is shown by the gray scales in the background here which, which again is radar backscatter showing the oldest ice by high backscatter shown in white here and the youngest ice by dark back, uh, low backscatter shown uh, in black. 
And so, you know, mean thickness, as I as I alluded to, isn't the the most useful information. What we really want is as thickness distributions, uh, which are shown uh, in the uh, along the rim here. And you know, so so not only do we see thick, uh, differences in mean thickness, but we see uh, differences in the characteristic thickness distributions. For example, here in Fram Strait and north of uh, Svalbard, you see uh, these bimodal thickness distributions. This uh, being representing the multi-year ice, and this representing the thin ice and leads. And because in, in this region the ice is very divergent, there is a larger abundance of these leads and of this thin ice, right? Which is in strong contrast to the region north of Canada here, where you can see these. This is the thickest ice. You see these strong tails of pressure ridges, and you can see there are no uh, leads whatsoever, and, and just some older first year ice here uh, in one of the flats. So the final method, and, and you know, of course, as I said, airborne measurements are still limited. So ultimately, we want to measure the ice by a satellite. And uh, as I said, there is no geophysical, no, no no direct method. And the best method so far is by means of laser or radar altimetry, which uh, actually measures uh, the height of the ice uh, above the surface of the water, which we call freeboard. And uh, again, because the ice uh, over large scales is, is an isostatic equilibrium from the height uh, of the surface of the ice, we can infer the thickness of the ice. However, there are actually you know, numerous uh, difficulties related to the unknown sea surface height, which, as you know, is related to uh, uh, geoid undulations, which is not very well known in the Arctic, uh, and uh, uh, dynamic ocean current uh, topography. So these methods are still under development. But because we can uh, perform these uh, in situ validation or airborne in validation measurements, we have actually been hired by uh, the European Space Agency and by NASA to perform these uh, validation measurements. And this graph here shows a comparison of Cryosat, that's the uh, ESA uh, radar altimeter satellite, with our airborne EM thickness measurements. And you can see that you know, our methods are in, in reasonable agreement. And so the, the strategy really is to have a few key regions of intensive in situ and airborne measurements and then to use those to extrapolate and to calibrate and validate the satellite measurements to provide Arctic-wide uh, coverage. And so uh, this graph is uh, a summary of our best knowledge of ice thickness change in the Arctic, actually, which, as I uh, mentioned, starts in the 1950s where the data are less reliable, but uh, they are most reliable starting in 1975, uh, summarizing the results from uh, submarine measurements in the winter shown in blue and in the summer shown in red here. And uh, these, these measurements show the, the decreasing thickness of the ice from in the winter mean thicknesses just below 4 meters to uh, about uh, 2.5 meters here in the end of uh, in, in, in the year 2000. And then because this is military data, it actually only gets released after a certain time period. And in fact, since 2000, there have hardly been any new data releases. And so we are fully relying on, on satellite measurements and our own airborne measurements. And so these satellite measurements, NASA had the ISAT satellite. Uh, the results are shown uh, here in winter and summer as well. And since uh, the 1990s, we have visited the North Pole in the summer which is shown by these measurements. These are our EM measurements. And so overall, these measurements all agree in that the thickness of the ice has uh, decreased. There is a strong seasonal cycle, right, of about one meter between summer and winter on average. And the seasonal cycle disagrees uh, between the submarine measurement and the satellite measurements, for example. And also, our early EM measurements agree with the winter measurements of those other methods, and later on only agree with the summer measurements. So there are still some fundamental issues about intercomparability of these different methods as well. And then these measurements, and again, the submarine data have only been released in the interior of the Arctic Ocean. You know, they wouldn't tell us when they have sailed in Canadian waters. So we don't have submarine data from the Canadian Arctic, uh, uh, where we have seen the ice is the thickest. And so we have to consider the large regional variability. And sure enough, this is a summary of uh, our measurements out of ALERT, which we have performed since 10 years, which show strong internal variability and show that there the ice is still very, very thick, right, with mean thicknesses between 4 and 5 meters, uh, but, but slowly decreasing overall as well. And so uh, my, my objective really is to continue these observations and to integrate our airborne measurements with all the other data sets that are there. And I have students working with the altimeter data sets, and I have projects with ESA and NASA uh, 
to, to get this community effort together to, uh, to understand this all. So yeah, I hope I am not running out of time here. Uh, so now I wanted to talk about the future, and uh, I mean the future of the ice is uncertain to say the least, uh, but it is likely uh, that it's getting less, right? <laughs> And so uh, the question is, what are the implications? And of course, you know, in, in Canada in particular, I mean, we hope for easier shipping, or maybe we don't because it has environmental risks and all this. And uh, but we hope for better access to natural resources. Uh, we are worried about uh, threats to Canadian sovereignty and American ships traveling our Northwest Passage. Uh, but also, our Arctic may be the last refuge, the last, re last region where there will be ice. And so the last regions where polar bears uh, may have a chance to survive. And so it is a region of high focus. And I just want to give you a few examples of uh, current research. I won't talk about polar bears um, and, and show you in particular where stickness measurements play an important role. And so uh, about shipping, uh, there are studies, you know, taking climate models and projecting them in the future and um, marry these with uh, ice navigation models, so the ships have different ice classes and there is the polar ice class that can break, you know, the thickest ice and there's ice strengthened ships that can encounter ice but not break ice and there are uh, ships that can only sail in open water. And uh, this map shows uh, the, the situation today and actually which, which resembles what, what is taking place already. Uh, the northeast passage along the Russian or the northern sea route along the Russian coast uh, can be sailed today almost uh, routinely and, and predictably during a few weeks during the summer by open water ship, which is water ships which is shown in blue here. And occasionally ice capable ships actually take a shortcut and uh, sail uh, f uh, further north and, and, and including breaking some ice. And of course they do this because this is the much shorter route between the Asian ports uh, and the North American and European ports than the route through the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal or around Africa, right? Um, and so uh, you can see that actually today no ship really routinely and commercially sails the Northwest pas Passage uh, through Canada and it is still not feasible and it's not predictable because of the large variability and the reliance on Coast Guard uh, icebreaker support. However, <coughs> uh, in, in, in 40 years from now, which is shown here, uh, these models show that it is actually quite uh, feasible that both open water ships even and ice breaking capable or ice capable ships can sail the Northwest Passage. So this is in 40 years and uh, assuming that the ice will continue to shrink uh, as it does and you can see that even across the North Pole ice capable cargo ships will be able uh, to sail. So uh, th there will be fundamental changes to uh, to the economy of shipping uh, and to the pressures of providing safe and uh, uh, efficient and, and planable shipping along the Northwest Passage, right? So, so this is, I mean, this this is a significant uh, sovereign and, and government responsibility here. However, uh, because we have the thickest ice in Canada, uh, there is still a threat from the incurrence of multi-ice. And I wanted to show you this animation again, which again shows radar backscatter. Uh, during a, a single year, and again you see the, the northwest, the Canadian Arctic and the Northwest Passage. There are actually two routes: the southern route and the northern route. And you can see that in this animation, you can see uh, in the summer when when the ice breaks up here, there are these incursions, incursions of thick multi-year ice uh, into the Northwest Passage, which, which pose a threat for ships. And uh, you know, again, this shows them very nicely. Uh, this is the summer when. The ice is wet and cannot be distinguished by satellite, but this is the fall, and here you can see, maybe I run this again, here you can see how the thick white ice actually uh, drifts into the Northwest Passage. Here, now you can see how it spreads out, right? So, so, so this is the, the heaviest, the most dangerous ice, and it will remain for many years to come. And so, as part of this, we had the opportunity to actually survey some of this ice. This is just a map of the Canadian archipelago. Again, this, these are the straits through which uh, this ice uh, goes, and this is the northern route of the Northwest Passage. Resolute Bay is here, which is uh, the, the Natural Resources Canada uh, logistics bay, so, so most of or much research uh, takes place out of here. And so in 2011, we had the chance to survey some of this multi-ice, and the results are shown here. The red is the raw data and the, the blue is the one kilometer moving averages of ice thickness. And this is about 250 kilometers. 
And so you can see that, that uh, you know, in, in the in the spring here of 2011, representative of other springs, there can be very thick ice in the Northwest Passage, and this shows that over you know over 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 lengths of one kilometer, uh, the mean thickness can uh, be four meters and more, still right. And so this is the ice that of course melts last, and uh, that is very difficult to break and, and to manage by ships. Um, so, and in terms of more engineering projects, uh, of course, because the EM method is so suitable, we have uh, subsequently tried to adapt it to whatever uh, uh, vehicle, moving vehicle, we could get our hands on. And so we have operated this in front of uh, ships to measure the thickness uh, en route uh, as we were breaking the ice, which is a very efficient way of measuring ice thickness. And we have mounted this on top of, uh, in front of hovercrafts, for example, this is this infamous uh, Norwegian hovercraft that's just uh, overwintering at the North Pole to do seismic measurements of Lomonosov Ridge, uh, I guess to question the Canadian claim for the North Pole. Um, and, and so we've been involved in an International Polar Year uh, project uh, where, where a, an airship was going to sail across the North Pole on the, uh, on following the tracks of Amundsen, and we wanted to hang a bird uh, under here. And, and this project has uh, uh, developed very far, but then actually the airship crashed in southern France on one of the last tests before setting out to the Arctic. Um, <laughs> I just show these because this is the typical uh, geophysical struggle, right? So uh, these ship-based measurements have been very relevant uh, in other developments uh, in preparing for the Arctic, and that is with regard to ice management. Ice management, uh, I, engineers, uh, offshore engineers, uh, call the activity where they try to break the ice into small enough pieces that a drill ship can uh, maintain its operations in the presence of a drifting uh, ice sheet. And so uh, in 2009, for example, we performed this ice management trial uh, where we had two icebreakers and a virtual ice ship, which uh, you have to, a uh, drill ship, which you have to imagine uh, performing a drill operation with dynamic uh, positioning at approximately here. And you have to imagine that the ice drifts, right? So the ice moves past the drill ship coming from here and, and drifting past here. And ice management means to break the ice into small enough pieces that the drill ship can maintain operations and position, as I said. And so the strategy is to have a strong icebreaker, which is the Swedish icebreaker Odin here, to uh, do the hard work and to break the largest pieces pieces of ice into smaller pieces, and then to have a smaller icebreaker and a mowing the lawn strategy to mill this ice into, into very small pieces. And so the success uh, of, of, of this operation, of course, can only be evaluated if you know the thickness of the ice uh, to begin with, and if you know how a, a certain ship performs uh, in, in ice of certain thicknesses, right? Because if this ship gets stuck here, uh, it can't break the ice anymore, and so then the drill ship uh, will be threatened eventually. So then there needs to be a call to abandon the drilling activities and all this. And so ice thickness is, is, is one of the most important operational and design parameters. And uh, this example just shows a typical section of uh, an icebreaker uh, going through the ice. Uh, and, and the thickness of the ice is shown in red here. And you can see at the outset uh, the ice is about two meters thick with pressure ridges once again. And the blue curve shows the uh, speed of the ship. And uh, then you can see all of a sudden the icebreaker encounters some very thick ice, a big, a thick uh, pressure ridge. And you can see how the speed of the ice uh, reduce uh, of the icebreaker reduces until eventually it comes uh, to a stop. It gets stuck. And what an icebreaker does then? It starts ramming, right? So it backs up uh, to 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 leave an, an open channel, which you can see here with ice thickness zero in front of the ship, and then it reverses and and pushes ahead and. Uh, slides onto the ice and, and breaks the ice. And so you can see one of these ramming uh, sequences here uh, until the, f the ship eventually uh, can bre breaks the ice uh, uh, through this pressure ridge, encounters thin ice again, can accelerate again, and a new cycle of, of breaking and ramming starts, right? And so uh, you can then uh, compare the speed of the ship with the thickness of the ice. And these curves are actually what's really, uh, what really matters for naval architecture to design the, the ideal hulls and to, to study the behavior of the ship and the ice. And so these all have been derived by ship-based along track as thickness service during uh, such trials. The other, and this is the last example really, uh, is uh, uh, evaluation of ice forces. The, the most important parameter controlling the ice loads and structures is the thickness of the ice, but it's very difficult to measure. And so uh, we had the luck 
that uh, we, we were once able to equip this lighthouse in the Bay of Bothnia in Finland in the Baltic Sea, which stood in the middle of the drifting uh, sea ice in the Baltic Sea, right, they have a lot of ice in Finland, uh, and, and acted as an icebreaker itself. And so we had uh, load panels mounted at the waterline here at this uh, lighthouse, and as the ice was moving past the lighthouse, uh, it, it exerted these forces and, and caused vibrations in the structure and all this, and uh, simultaneously we measured uh, the thickness of the ice with an EM31 uh, instrument suspended by this uh, rig here, and in this project we also were lucky that we had an upward looking sonar measuring the thickness uh, of the ice from below. And so, uh, in general, uh, you know, yeah, the, the, the thicker the ice is which shown on the x-axis, the, the larger the forces. However, you see there's a lot of scatter, right? So there are other uh, properties like the integrity of the ice that, that, that determine forces. But what this figure also shows is that the ULS, the upward looking sonar, the M measurements uh, resulted in different results and uh, or in different uh, uh, regressions. And the reason, of course, is that the M underestimates deformed ice pressure ridges because these are 3D structures. With our method, we can't account for the 3D structure. We assume it's a 1D structure because of the footprint of the method, we actually measure a higher conductivity uh, of the underground of the volume of the half space beneath the instrument than would correspond to the maximum thickness of the ice. And therefore, we underestimate the maximum thickness of pressure ridges. And uh, this can be seen in this graph, and this actually has been, is, a, is still a unique experiment where we were able to measure the ice both from below, you know, which is sort of the true thickness, and measure the EM response. And you can see that uh, the ULS uh, thickness is approximately two times as large as the M thickness, which means that with the M, under these ice conditions, we underestimate the maximum thickness by as much as uh, 50 percent, uh, which is a, a, an important shortcoming uh, of the M method, which, which we are addressing through inversion and, and, and 3D uh, finite element modeling using COMSOL and, and things like this. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you, okay, and this is, this is actually is the last thing, but uh, so uh, with thinning ice, you know, Inuit travel and recreational travel, hunting travel and recreational travel becomes more dangerous on the one hand, but there are other changes in the Arctic ecosystem, and, uh, but, but very little is actually known about the thicknesses within the Canadian Arctic, which is all immobile land fast ice in the winter. And so uh, we had the opportunity to work together with some uh, local hunters here in Jones Sound, which is between Ellesmere Island and Devon Island out of Greece Fjord, which is the northernmost village in Canada actually. And uh, during these snowmobile trips we mounted again an EM31 in the back and so we can measure, you know, wherever they go along track. And so we made these interesting discoveries actually. If you ask Environment Canada they tell you, you know, because they, they have never been able to measure this properly, uh, because they still use drill holes, uh, they would tell you the ice is two meters thick. That's like the climatological thickness. However, if you go into these fjords and, and and all over the place you can see that there are regions where the ice is much, much thinner, as thin as uh, 50 centimeters only. Uh, and so, so these are some real discoveries if you want so, and subsequently we've combined this with ocean measurements of water temperature and salinity to evaluate the heat flux. And what we actually found was that in these fjords there's very strong ocean heat flux uh, because of the tidal mixing and tidal currents that bring in warm water from lower layers and they maintain uh, a strong heat flux through the ice and, and prevent that the ice grows very fast. And I'm showing this because, again, you know, we, we talk about air temperatures and global warming and all this, but what we often forget is much, that much of the heat uh, that could be in the atmosphere is actually absorbed by the oceans and that the oceans warm a lot as well and that when we want to evaluate changes of, of sea ice thickness, we not only need to look at air temperatures and radiation and surface energy budget, or drift and deformation, we also have to look at changes of the ocean and how ocean heat flux varies with time, season and, uh, and regionally and how that can impact. And so ultimately, this is, uh, these are just some visible MODIS uh, satellite images from the same region. Uh, ultimately, you can see that where the ice is at its thinnest in the spring, this is also where the ice breaks up at the earliest, uh, as you can see by these dark colors. They, they indicate that here you have open water whereas the proper uh, of Jones Sound is uh, still covered by ice. And so the thinner the ice is, the earlier this ice will disappear in the spring and will form these open pollinias, for example, and because there's upwelling, these regions have implications for the ecosystem, for example, for primary productivity, for local weather, 
and uh, seals and polar bears and for the hunting of Inuit, right? And uh, I, I didn't want to address this at all, but this figure actually shows an ice core extracted from a sea ice flow. And, and here you see the bottom of the ice and you see this uh, brown coloration which is actually due to algae. Uh, the ice is an important habitat and is, uh, is very important for primary productivity of the polar oceans and it uh, supports a, a rich and abundant uh, biological community of, of uh, phytoplankton. And so uh, this finally and really uh, brings me to the end of uh, this presentation. Uh, I hope uh, you uh, take home with you that uh, uh, Arctic sea ice is shrinking a lot. Yes, there's no doubt about this. And uh, it's almost evident that, uh, or imminent that it will disappear uh, sometime in the future. But because of the variability, the strong interannual variability, and because of these di all different processes, and as you can see in Antarctica, it is not really clear uh, when it will uh, have uh, disappeared completely. And so the trend we see is, is, you know, due to a superposition of generally thinner ice and weaker ice and younger ice superimposed by interannual variations which are due to winds primarily and so weather, right? And, and uh, as long as we can't predict weather uh, well over, you know, I'm not saying we can predict it, you have to be careful. You can predict it very well in the short term, but on the long term we struggle. And so as long as we can't predict the long term weather and winds, we, we cannot easily predict uh, the sea ice. And so EM induction, uh, you know, and, and, and in exploration geophysics, uh, frequency domain EM has, has not plays, does not play such a strong role anymore, unfortunately. But it's the tool for uh, ice thickness measurements, sea ice thickness measurements. And, you know, of course, unfortunately, it doesn't work over freshwater, right, over lakes or rivers. Often people say, well, can you not just measure here? But it only works over the ocean, so it's a real marine application because only there we have the strong conductivity contrast. And uh, so, uh, yeah, as thickness information is important for all these future activities. Uh, however, because uh, this is still dependent on, on, on the presence there, the challenge really is to maintain these surveys uh, because, of course, they are so expensive. And uh, so the future really, and this is what I didn't really talk about, but I have some slides if you're interested, and I'd be happy to uh, interpreters of, of course, using multi-frequency instruments and, and, and more proper geophysical inversion to uh, not only evaluate the thickness of the ice, but for example, the porosity or the conductivity of pressure ridges and to allow 3D inversion of uh, pressure ridges. Um, and to, to marry the EM measurements with radar measurements, for example, or LIDAR measurements to get more information about the roughness of the ice and the thickness of its snow cover. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, stop here and, and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, um, member, we have a microphone for any questions. So, um, are there any questions for Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you're trying to sort out some of these 3D issues using modeling software like Oxal. It seems to me that it might also be useful to have some ground truths from an upward-looking acoustic sensing of the bottom. Yes. Data available? Uh, well, uh, you're absolutely right. It, 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 it's extremely desirable to have coincident measurements, right? Uh, and this example I did show you at the lighthouse, that was actually one example where, where this would be possible in theory. Um, however, the, the problem, you know, and this is to the core of EM induction sounding, right? The core of the problem is that the uh, acoustic sounder only measures the envelope of the ridge and cannot address the porosity of the ridge, which also contributes to its conductivity. And so somehow uh, we have to be able to distinguish between the effects of, of, of the geometry on the EM signal and the increased conductivity at the same time, right? But uh, I mean, absolutely, and then this is actually what we, what we have, uh, what we're pursuing and where we have a few successful examples. At least if you know the geometry from uh, upward looking sauna measurements, then you only have one unknown, which is the porosity of the Kia. Yeah. We have a couple of questions online. Okay. Um, anything similar done in the Antarctica? Uh, 
Um, yes and no. Uh, we have performed similar measurements in Antarctica, uh, but not as routinely. So there are only occasional snapshot measurements, and typically in much smaller regions. So we 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 have and well and, and okay. I'm only talking about myself now, which I shouldn't. But uh, <laughs> so that there are no known uh, nuclear submarine measurements in Antarctica, for example, because of the Antarctic Treaty, which is an interesting. Uh, aspect that that prohibits military and nuclear operations in Antarctica, and again, you know, they, they may be all over the place, but they don't tell us. Um, and so, uh, since the onset of satellite altimetry, there have been uh, attempts to monitor Antarctic wild ice thickness. Yeah, but it's more difficult in Antarctica because of the the, the ice is covered by a thicker snow cover. And you know, I didn't get into the nitty gritty of of altimetry, but. Uh, the the isostasy, isostasy, of course, is highly modulated by the thickness of the snow, and laser altimetry is strongly affected by variations in snow thickness, and that, that's even more difficult in Antarctica than it is in the Arctic because of the thicker snow cover. There is another question. Uh, did you have to account for ice surface elevation variations caused by tides or wave oscillations during the EM survey? Uh, no, we don't, because the ice floats. And so for what we are doing with the EM survey, uh, we don't need to care about. Uh, but for laser altimetry or altimetry in general, uh, you, you have strongly to take account of that, right? Because uh, your freeboard changes with the surface of the water and the tides. But uh, we, uh, and, and this is actually, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you consider the method, uh, this is also why we can do this measurement with varying aircraft or EM bird uh, height variations. We don't care about this because uh, they are rather good because they confirm our, our calibration on this exponential curve, but because we know the height of our bird at any time from our laser altimeter, right? so this doesn't affect our measurement. So there's no requirement for the pilot to fly as uh, stable an altitude as he can. There are more questions than that? Yeah, I'm sure there are. I was uh, one of the few uh, in this audience, I believe, who heard the special presentation on the discovery of the artifacts from the uh, Franklin expedition. Oh, good. And there was a uh, well, excellent presentation. But it was aided, of course, at least in my understanding, by the retreat of the sea ice in the Arctic. The search for it. Yet, of course, all the uh, scientists who were involved tiptoed around the world uh, climate change. So, do you have, have to uh, exercise similar sensitivity when we seek funding? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <laughs> um, we are university, right? So, supposedly, we are free. Um, <laughs> And it seems that, that climate change still provides more funding for us uh, that, that, than it doesn't, but we don't know what happens in the background, right? But, uh, I, I, mean, I, I mean, the answer is no. I, I don't think uh, we, I, I think we, we are benefiting from the attention that is paid to the Arctic, and that is clearly due to climate change. And, uh, and in this sense, even the government doesn't deny climate change, right? I mean, the, the discussion really evolves about what's responsible for the changes. Uh, but it's actually, you know, so 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 like the, the the public discussion is completely skewed in this regard, and and everybody just picks out a, a single aspect, right? Because with with last year's discovery, uh, they like I heard somebody of the team talking about that they actually benefited from the fact that this year was an extreme ice year. Like this year, the ice cover was relatively large again, and ice conditions were quite severe in the Northwest Passage, um, and. So because there was so much ice, they couldn't actually go to the region they initially wanted to go there, to go to. The, they had to go to the alternative search area and because the, the primary priority area was covered by ice. And so only due, you know, due to the fact that the ice was there un unexpectedly, they were diverted to the region where they eventually found it. So uh, thanks to the ice and to sure. large variability. Okay, um, if I understand correctly, uh, you're saying that the, uh, your observations are indicating that the, uh, ex the lateral extent of the ice in the winter season is not shrinking, but the overall uh, 
average thickness of the ice is is shrink. Is that correct? No, the, no. In winter, it's shrinking as well. The lateral extent, as you say, but not. Uh, nearly as strongly as it is during the summer. And what I said is that the winter changes may be more representative actually of the mean climate state uh, of the Arctic and may be more related to you know, all the other changes we see because in the summer the, the actual end of summer uh, ice coverage is strongly determined by these feedback processes related to the melt ponding and really the weather. Like at what time do these ponds appear at the surface would there be snow cover events that you know cover the uh, ponds again uh, intermittently and so on? And the um, second question then: in the, the history of the Earth, how um, prevalent, how often is has there been uh, sea Arctic sea ice? Is it a is it an unusual time to have it, or is it all, is it more common to have it than not? Well, that's a that's a very good point, right? And and that's like the geology side uh, of things, um, and and where the question comes, how unprecedented is the situation we, we face at the moment? And I mean, to my knowledge, since hundreds of thousands of years, at least, which is short, uh, there, there always has been sea ice. Uh, but uh, there, there are indications that the last time the sea ice was as little as it is now was uh, four thousand years ago. A um, couple more online. How do you measure ice thickness in Antarctica? How do we measure ice thickness in Antarctica? Um, well, so so we have we only have these means to measure it, and so so if the if the question is you like me, uh, I, I'm still measuring it with uh, airborne EM whenever I have a chance to get there, which is very rarely and. Uh, most recently, I've uh, visited uh, with the Norwegian Antarctic program, who only were very uh, locally uh, near the continent uh, and near the American base uh, McMurdo. Uh, but my my former colleagues from Germany, they still do routine uh, uh, icebreaker cruises to the Weddell Sea, which is the region south of uh, in the Southern Atlantic and they uh, use Airborne EM as well, uh, but to supplement these radar and radar laser altimeter uh, satellite methods. Two more. Um, next one is, what about GPR techniques? Techniques Did you use them at all? Yeah, so I, I alluded to this. GPR is highly successful in measuring the thickness of glacial ice and ice sheets, uh, and you know, is extensively being employed uh, over the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheet from the air, even with with uh, fixed mounted, uh, fixed wing uh, systems. Uh, but over sea ice, GPR doesn't work because a the ice is so thin, so you have to use very high frequencies. And if you do this, uh, the strong scattering and absorption and the and the still saline ice, uh, so that uh, GPR isn't successful over sea ice. Did you use any other geophysical methods? such as gravity and radiometry? Uh, uh, gravity and radiometry doesn't work either because the ice is in isostatic equilibrium, so there wouldn't be gravity uh, differences really. Um, uh, and the density contrast between the ice and the water is very small, right? It's only a tenth. Uh, however, actually in my PhD, uh, I employed uh, DC electrical methods, which work relatively well, but you know suffer from uh, uh, contact issues of, of the electrodes, of course, and of course from the fact that they require contact to the ice. Uh, but I actually used uh, seismic measurements uh, sled with the sledgehammer source, and what we were using was not uh, reflection or refraction seismics, uh, but uh, uh, surface wave uh, uh, seismics, which uses flexural waves. Uh, and, and, and puts the ice in, in, into resonance and creates these nice dispersive waves. And they are they can travel long distances, and they are sensitive to the thickness of the ice uh, and and the mean thickness along the path actually. So they are and, and, and they are sensitive to elastic properties. So for engineering applications, they can actually uh, yield some useful information. But like uh, DC resistivity, they're too hard to perform uh, to cover large regions and, and require access to the ice right then. <laughs> you may have partially answered my uh, question with your last remark. You mentioned ice integrity as an important parameter of predicting, say, damage to structures and resistance to ice breaking. Is 
one way of measuring that separately from ice thickness? Well, our, our best uh, approach really is through porosity. Um, because the more porous the ice is, the more the weaker it will be. Um, and so if we can, and then this alludes to uh, inverting for the conductivity of the ice as well, right? If we were sensitive to the conductivity of the ice, uh, we could uh, estimate its porosity and therefore its strength. And in fact, uh, the, you know, there's, there's differences on large scales, but the, the most, one of the most important differences between first-year ice and multi-year ice, because first-year ice is still relatively saline and still relatively porous and is therefore uh, much weaker, whereas multi-ice has undergone a summer smelt and then all the salt has flushed out and the pores have been plugged and refrozen by the meltwater percolating from above. And so multi-ice is considered the most hardest and uh, the, the hardest and the most uh, hazardous ice. And uh, if we could uh, from the air, I mean you can, as, as the satellite radar satellite images showed, you can actually distinguish between first years and multi years with uh, a radar uh, from radar backscatter. But uh, if we could measure the conductivity, whose contrasts are very small, right, about 50 millisiemens or so, then we could also observe the toughness of the, uh, the hardness of the ice with EM. Are there uh, any other questions from the room? Yeah, there's one here. One more. What about seismic microvibrations, like seismic noise? Can they be used on this, in this case to determine the two layers model with different velocities? Uh, yeah, actually, so these sledgehammer measurements I mentioned are sort of uh, micro uh, vibrations. Um, and there are natural signals as well. So when, when these pressure ridges form, uh, they form when flows collide, which of course happens relatively slowly, but then uh, when when you form a crack and, and, and pile up these icebergs, you have a lot of acoustic noise in the ice, and some of these signals uh, could be used actually, but their energy is relatively low compared to a, a, to a sledgehammer source. Last chance. Yeah, I have questions? Okay, I guess, I guess not. So I will then thank you very much, Dr. Haas. That was excellent. Thank you.